This talk is about polynomial equations and how to solve them. But what is a polynomial equation? In particular, what are linear and quadratic equations and what methods have been used to solve them? Who first solved cubic equations? And can all polynomial equations be solved? A polynomial is an algebraic expression like the one shown here. 3x to the fifth plus 4x to the fourth minus 8x squared minus 5x plus 6, which is obtained by adding and subtracting powers of a variable x and their multiples, such as 3 times x to the fifth and minus 8 times x squared. A polynomial equation is then an equation where a polynomial is put equal to zero. The degree of a polynomial is its highest power. Here the degree is 5 because the highest power appearing is x to the power 5. Our aim is then to find solutions of the equation. For example, this equation has x equals 1 as a solution because when we substitute 1 for x and its powers, we get 3 plus 4 minus 8 minus 5 plus 6, which equals 0. It also has four other solutions. In this talk, our concern is mainly with solving linear equations, those of degree 1, such as ax plus b equals 0, where a and b are constants, and quadratic equations, those of degree 2, with a term involving x squared. But we'll also look at some cubic equations, those of degree 3, with a term involving x cubed. People have been solving equations for thousands of years, although our algebraic notation is only some 400 years old. Here are two problems involving linear equations from an Egyptian papyrus dating from about 1800 BC. The first of these, problem 26, shown here, asks for a quantity which, together with a quarter of it, give 15 or in our algebraic notation, which they didn't have, x plus a quarter x equals 15. The second equation asks for the quantity which, together with two-thirds of it, one-half of it, and one-seventh of it, gives 33. And again, we can rewrite this algebraically. There are several similar problems on this part of the papyrus, which suggests that it may have been used for teaching. How did the Egyptians solve such problems? For several of them, they used the method of false position, where they guessed a solution and then scaled it up or down as necessary. Here, because of the one-fourth, we might try four. Then the quantity in its fourth part is four plus one, which is five. But we want 15, not five. And so we scale our guess of 4 by a factor of 3, giving us the answer 12. Problem 31 is much more complicated. And using our algebraic notation, we can solve it to give the answer 14 and 28 over 97. On the papyrus, they gave their answer in terms of unit fractions of the form 1 over something, as 14, plus 1 over 4, plus 1 over 56, and so on, illustrating the amazing facility they had when calculating with these unit fractions. A different type of problem appears with many others of a similar type on this Mesopotamian clay tablet, also from around 1800 BC. It asks, I found a stone but did not weigh it. After I weighed out eight times its weight, added three gin, and added one-third of one-thirteenth multiplied by twenty-one, I weighed it. One mana. What was the weight of the stone? This clearly isn't a practical problem. To find the weight of the stone, we could simply weigh it. And it was probably used for teaching purposes. But using our algebraic notation, let x be the stone's weight in gin. Then 8 times its weight plus 3 gin is 8x plus 3. 
We then add 1 third times 1 thirteenth times 21 times this amount. And simplifying this, we then get 20 over 13 times 8x plus 3. Putting this equal to 1 mana, or 60 gin, then gives us x equals 4 and a half gin as the weight of the stone. Let's now move on to quadratic equations, those with an x squared term in them. The two most familiar ways of solving these, which we learn at school, are both shown here. We'll illustrate them with the specific equation x squared plus 10x minus 39 equals 0, which we'll meet again later. The first method is to factorise it. Here the clue is the 39, which is 3 times 13, giving us the factorization x squared plus 10x minus 39 equals x minus 3 times x plus 13. But since their product is 0, either x minus 3 or x plus 13 must be 0. That is, x is 3 or minus 13. The second method uses the familiar quadratic equation formula, that is, x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a. Here, a is 1, b is 10, and c is minus 39. So x equals minus 10 plus or minus the square root of b squared, that's 100, minus 4 times 1 times minus 39, which is plus 156, all divided by 2a, which is 2. Now 100 plus 156 is 256, with square root 16. And so the answers are minus 10 plus or minus 16, all divided by 2, which give us x equals 3, or minus 13, as before. Remarkably, solving quadratic equations can be traced back almost 4,000 years to this Mesopotamian clay tablet, which includes several examples of a similar type. One of these is given here. I have subtracted the side of my square from the area, 1430. You write down 1, the coefficient. You take half of 1, 0, 30, and 0, 30 you multiply. You add 0, 15 to 1430. Result, 1430, 15. This is the square of 2930. You add 0, 30 to 2930. Result, 30, the side of the square. Whatever this may mean, it's surely a step-by-step -step procedure or algorithm for solving the problem. Notice first that they use a number system based on 60 rather than our decimal system, so that 1430 means 14 times 60 plus 30, which is 870 in decimals. Also 030 means 30 over 60, which is one half and so on. Here's the explanation. Although we can't literally subtract the side of a square from its area, we can interpret this as x squared minus x, and this is equal to 870. How did they solve this? They first took 1, which is the minus b in the quadratic equation, halved it, and squared the result to give one quarter. They then added this to 870 to give 870 and a quarter, and took the square root of this to give 2930, or 29 and a half. Finally, adding the half they had earlier gave them the correct answer of 30 for x. You can check that these steps, described so long ago, corresponding to building up the quadratic equation formula. This method for solving quadratic equations is sometimes called completing the square, and we can see this more clearly 
from a geometrical solution presented in Baghdad by the 9th century Persian mathematician Muhammad al-Khwarizmi in a book that he'd written. Its title contained the term algebra, which gave us the word algebra. He considered the problem one square and 10 roots of the same amount to 39 dirhams, which means x squared plus x equals 39. Here, a dirham is a unit of currency. To solve this, he drew the shaded square on the left with side x and area x squared, and added to it two rectangles of size 5 by x. These two rectangles have total area 10x. He then completed the square by adding the shaded 5 by 5 square on the right. The resulting large square has side x plus 5, so its area is x plus 5 all squared, which multiplies out to give x squared plus 10x plus 25. But x squared plus 10x is 39, and so we now have 39 plus 25, which is 64 as the area of the large square. So the side of the square is the square root of 64, which is 8. That is, x plus 5 equals 8, giving x equals 3 as the solution to the problem. Notice that negative numbers were then considered to be meaningless. So the alternative solution, x equals minus 13, which we found earlier, did not arise. What about cubic equations? For many years, these were considered impossible to solve. Indeed, it wasn't until the early 16th century that they were solved in general, in Italy. At that time, university teachers had little job security, and to show their superiority and to secure their positions, they needed to submit themselves to public problem-solving contests. Around the year 1500, one of them, Scipione del Ferro, discovered how to solve cubic equations of the form x cubed plus cx equals d, which we'll call type 1. And he revealed his method to his pupil, Antonio Fior. A little later, Niccolo of Brescia, known as Tartaglia the Stammerer after his face had been slashed by a sabre in childhood, found a method for solving cubic equations of the form x cubed plus bx squared equals d, which we'll call type 2. But by this time, Del Ferro had died, and Fior felt himself free to challenge Tartaglia to a public contest, giving him 30 type 1 cubic equations to solve. In return, Tartaglia gave Fior 30 type 2 equations. But Tartaglia was a far better mathematician than Fior, who failed to solve Tartaglia's equations. Meanwhile, Tartaglia, after a sleepless night, managed to solve all of Fior's type 1 equations, and so won the contest. Here briefly is the method Tartaglia used to solve type 1 cubics. He first sought two numbers u and v with difference d and product c over 3 all cubed. Finding these involved solving only quadratic equations. A solution to the equation was then the cube root of u minus the cube root of v. For example, for the equation x cubed plus 9x equals 26, where c is 9 and d is 26, he would seek numbers u and v, where u minus v is 26, and u times v is 3 cubed, or 27. Solving these gives u equals 27 and v equals 1, and so x is the cube root of 27 minus the cube root of 1, giving 3 minus 1 equals 2. 
The general solution to equations of this type is the complicated formula given below. But notice that, like the quadratic formula, it involves only arithmetical operations such as adding and multiplication and the taking of roots. At this stage, another mathematician named Cardano entered the scene. He was writing what would become a classic algebra text, the great art. And on hearing about the Fior Tartaglia contest, he wanted to learn Tartaglia's method for type 1 equations. The secretive Tartaglia was reluctant to reveal it, but finally agreed to do so when Cardano promised to give him an introduction to the city's Spanish governor who might be approached for funding. Cardano gave a solemn oath never to reveal Tartaglia's method. But on learning later that it had been discovered by Del Ferro, he went ahead and published it. Tartaglia was outraged and spent his remaining years writing him vitriolic letters. By this time, quartic equations, polynomial equations of degree 4, had also been solved and Cardano duly included them in his book. Finally, what about polynomial equations of degree 5 or more? Can these be solved with only arithmetic operations and the taking of roots? The search for such methods continued through the 17th and 18th centuries by Joseph-Louis Lagrange in France, who formulated a new approach. This was then taken up by the Italian Paolo Ruffini, who produced a proof that no such methods or formulas can exist for these higher degrees. But his proof contained a gap. This gap was eventually filled by the Norwegian Niels Henrik Arbel in the 1820s, who proved the result shown here. No general method or formula exists for solving polynomial equations of degree 5 or more. His work was then extended by the brilliant young French mathematician Avris Galois, who developed powerful algebraic criteria for deciding which equations can be solved. Tragically, both of these young men died very early, with Arbel contracting tuberculosis at the age of 26, and Galois dying in a duel of honour at the age of just 20 having spent his final night writing up his results for posterity. It would be some years before it was finally realised what a genius the world had lost. And with that sad ending, I thank you for listening.